All right, well, let's get started. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the GHEX uh, online webinar series on advancing freedom, how to start a homeschool legal defense organization in your country. My name is Mike Donnelly. I'm senior counsel uh, with HSLD, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. I've been serving as an HSLDA attorney for 15 years and the director for global outreach. I also teach uh, constitutional law and international human rights law for Regent University. And uh, I'm pleased to welcome you and our speakers today. Uh, this webinar series is a project of the Global Home Education Exchange Council. It's a joint project of the Outreach and Advocacy Committee. Uh, Peter Stock is the chair of the Outreach Committee. I chair the Advocacy Committee of the Global Home Education Exchange Council. Peter is the president of HSLDA Canada, and together we'll be moderating this five webinar series on how to start a homeschool organization uh, or legal defense organization in your country. Our goal for this series is to help you as a leader in your country to create an important support structure for the homeschool community in your country. Uh, GHEX is supported by many organizations and individuals. And I wanna thank all of those who are part of the network and who support the work to advance freedom for homeschooling around the world. We believe that everyone everywhere should have easy access to home education without undue burden from government regulation. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights states in Article 26.3 that parents have a prior right to decide what kind of education their children shall receive. And every country is different and has a different legal and regulatory structure, but ultimately we believe that home education is a natural, fundamental, and inalienable right that everyone has the right to freely practice. To support the home educating community around the world, GHEX uh, tries to connect leaders to each other for support. We try to support research and influence policy. You can get more information at www.ghex.world for more information, and I do serve on the board of GHEX. Uh, home education is growing massively all over the world as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and other things that are happening, but its legal status in some countries is unclear. We affirm, as I said, the fundamental human right of home education, but in some countries, governments have been taking steps to repress home education. Countries like France, for example, which recently passed a law restricting homeschooling more than ever. But even when laws recognize homeschooling rights, challenges can still exist to homeschooling. So what can you do? Well, one step that has been successful in some countries is to start a legal defense organization that is equipped to advocate in the courts of law, in the legislatures, and in public opinion to defend home education. But for busy homeschooling parents who are often volunteers, and may not have a lot of experience in legal or public advocacy, this may seem a daunting task. So we're sponsoring this webinar series to give new homeschool movements insight from decades of experience from leaders in other countries that have established national legal defense organizations. Uh, here today, we have leaders from the United States, South Africa, uh, and Russia. Very excited about the talk that we're gonna have today. And uh, each speaker is gonna have um, about five to 10 minutes to make some opening remarks, and then we'll open it up for discussion. The questions that we're gonna be addressing in this session include, what are some of the major legal and legislative issues facing homeschoolers? When and why should a homeschool movement start its own legal defense organization? What are some services that an organization should offer? How can you recruit people to be involved? Where can you look for help? What obstacles can you expect? And the speakers today are going to share their own experiences from uh, starting organizations to support homeschooling in their countries or in their state or province. Uh, you've got the chat window available to you and I would like to ask you to send any questions you have to the speakers through the Q&A function. There's a button at the bottom of your menu bar there um, where you can submit those questions. It's called Q&A. So let's get started. Um, I just wanna start very briefly after the introduction here to set some context. Um, as I said, homeschooling is growing. Uh, at the height of the global pandemic, the UNESCO organization estimated that about 1.4 billion children were not in school because schools had shut down. Uh, and this created uh, a situation where many people were forced to figure out how to do education at home. 
Uh, not everybody chose to do that. Most people at that time were forced to do it, but there has been a number of people in, in many countries who've chosen to homeschool their children. Uh, and we've created support structures in those countries. Uh, now, as the virus is, appears to be, we hope, subsiding, uh, there are still other issues related to that with different mandates and things that are happening in schools all around the world that many parents are not comfortable with. And so many parents are still uh, continuing to homeschool, some because they tried it when schools were closed and they liked it and are continuing, others uh, because they're not comfortable with what the schools are requiring of their children. And so they're continuing to homeschool. So we've seen homeschooling grow dramatically. In the United States, uh, there may be as many as six, perhaps eight, even 10 million children homeschooled, which is uh, well over 10% and could be more of the school age population. And we've seen this in other countries. Uh, yet, even in spite of that, we've seen an opposition to homeschooling. We see countries introducing new regulations. For example, in France, we saw uh, the national parliament pass a law which um, requires parents to seek permission to homeschool before all parents had to do was file a notice and submit to a fairly intrusive inspection regime. But there wasn't a question that they had the right to do it. Now they have to defend their a choice to homeschool. In the United Kingdom, the government there continues to press for a list, a registry of, of home educators, um, trying to justify that by saying that the government needs to check up on every child who's not in school. In Panama, a, a very onerous law was proposed, but uh, through advocacy from Panamanian homeschoolers and with help from international homeschoolers and also HSL Day of the United States were able to intervene and a very favorable law uh, has passed, has become law and will be improved. Uh, recently, even in small countries like Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the, the government there is looking to regulate homeschooling. So we're seeing regulation uh, in countries growing as more people want to homeschool. We're also seeing hostility, really hostility from some global entities. For example, uh, a global coalition released what's called the Abidjan Principles two years ago, which calls for the state to be highly involved in overseeing private education. This threatens home education. Uh, the, United, the United Nations Education, Social and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, just yesterday released its UN Global Futures in Education, calling for a new social contract on education and trying to create a global community on education with a very significant role for quote unquote formal education as a way to advance their objectives of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, so we can see that there are forces at the national level, but also at the global and international level that are not favorable towards private or home education. So we, the home education community need to work together to create a network, to support each other, to encourage each other, to inform one another about what's happening. We need to work together because in our countries, we tend to be fairly small minorities, but together we uh, can support one another. And each of us in our own countries has opposition, even the, in the United States where we've been homeschooling for decades and decades and homeschooling is fairly well regarded and accepted. There are still uh, critics uh, in, the, in policy, uh, in the intellectual community that uh, are not favorable to home education. And so we need to be prepared uh, to make the positive case for homeschooling uh, so that more families can benefit from home education, but also we need to defend our cause from critics. And this may mean that we have to go to the legislatures to fight uh, policy initiatives, or we may have to go to the courts. And so that's why a legal defense organization and an advocacy organization is important. And so that's what this series is all about. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker. Our first speaker this morning is Mike Smith. Mike is my boss. He's my friend. Uh, he's a mentor. I have been so privileged to work for Mike Smith, who's the president of HSLDA of the United States. He's also the, one of the founders of HSLDA, um, a homeschooling father. He and his wife, Elizabeth, homeschooled their children for many years. Uh, Mike has been a tireless advocate for freedom. Uh, he is uh, an incredibly energetic and wonderful person. Uh, and I've been so privileged to Mike to work for you and to learn from you and the homeschool community in the United States and the world has been blessed and benefited by your support, by your leadership. So 
please share with us, uh, if you would, some of your experiences about getting started. What was it like in the early days? Because the early days of, of homeschooling in the United States is kind of like the what, what most countries are facing today. Uh, the, the hostility, the challenges that you led, you and Mike Ferris led uh, the homeschooling crew community through with others, of course, but uh, what was it like? What made you get started and share with us your wisdom and the things that you've learned over the years? So Mike Smith, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mike. Very, very kind words. And of course, uh, the race, you will get it now. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> So, folks, glad well, I still to have three kids today. to split through college, so I appreciate it. Glad that. to be with you today. <laughs> today we're in Virginia, and uh, we're having an interesting thing happen to our building. Our, our roof wore out, and so if you hear some pounding, you may hear it. There are roofers up there just pounding away on our trying to get our roof uh, back up. So, uh, it's a privilege to be with you today. So just going way back, kind of how I got involved in homeschooling, and then, of course, the, what happened with the leadership role, is that I got into homeschooling by accident. Actually, I wasn't looking to homeschool uh, until 1981. 1981, I, I'm a lawyer by profession. I was on my way to court, and I was listening to Dr. Dobson on fam, Focus on the Family Radio, and many of the leaders in the homeschool movement in the U.S. and around the world actually heard these programs, there was a series of programs that were actually broadcast by Dr. Dobson. Dr. Dobson, of course, back in 1980s was one of the leaders uh, in the Christian movement, uh, family movement. And he got interested in homeschooling and he met uh, a, a couple by the name of Dorothy and Raymond Moore. And they'd written some books, some very interesting books about early childhood development. And that's how they actually got into homeschooling by trying to figure out how kids learn best when they should be learning. And a couple of books that influenced my family, uh, my wife and I were Better Late Than Early in School Can Wait. And Dr. Moore was on that program and I was listening to Dobson and Dr. Moore was talking about basically an issue that we were dealing with in our family with one of our children. Uh, they were not interested in learning. They were at, at an age of five where we thought they should be learning, should be reading, et cetera, and they weren't. And they were flunking uh, preschool, which was really amazing. Uh, how you flunk preschool, I don't know, but they did. And so we were kind of dealing with that. My, my philosophy was better uh, early than late, because when I went to grade school, we didn't have kindergarten. I didn't get a chance, preschool, kindergarten, we didn't even know anything about that. So I thought, well, if I actually had kindergarten, I'd be a lot smarter. That was my thinking. So I wanted to make sure that my children got the benefits of that. But Dr. Moore and his wife, Dorothy, were saying just exactly the opposite. What they were saying is that children really at five and six, when many, uh, you know, many of our compulsory attendance ages in the states here in the United States are six, five, some of them go down to five, five, six, seven. Basically, what he said, that's too early for kids, uh, especially young boys. And that's kind of what we were dealing with. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And he had the research. I mean, this man had studied this and done the research on it. And his position was that the optimum age for young boys would be about eight or nine when they start formal education. Informal, no problem. When they want to learn, work with them. But formal education, when they're forced to sit down and start doing schoolwork, reading, computing, cognitive work, et cetera. And what he identified, and we see it uh, today, is that little boys tend to be behind the little girls. Now, the little girls, are, they're advancing quicker at that age. So what you have then in the school setting is you have the little boys trying to compete, and they're two years behind, perhaps, uh, in terms of maturity. They're trying to compete. They can't compete. What do they do? They act out. What happens then? They get labeled. What happens then? They can be taking drugs. So we see this today. It's not anything new. As long as the education so-called experts out there, they're pushing for earlier and earlier. As a matter of fact, the United States of America, uh, our president has put forth a bill. Mike has it passed that has actually 
early childhood education starting being funded by the federal government at three years of age. That's in the works. So <clears throat> anyway, I listened to that program and by the, actually, fortunately, I listened to the whole program because I was on I-10, a freeway in Los Angeles trying to get to court and we were stopped. <laughs> as does happen there occasionally. And so I heard the whole program and then toward the end of the program, Dr. Dobson introduced the term homeschooling and that's, I'd never heard it before. This is 1981, never heard homeschooling. I didn't know anybody ever did that, but they laid a strong case for homeschooling. And in that few minutes, I became an advocate for it. I came home, I talked it over with my wife. She was willing to at least examine it. And with a week, within a week, we were at a, homeschool conference in Northern California with Dr. Moore and his wife, Dorothy, and about 10 other families. That was a conference. That was a major conference back then. So uh, we committed to do it. This was in California. I didn't bother at the time to check to see if it was legal. You would think a lawyer would kind of think about that. I didn't think about it. I just assumed, you know, anything this good has, has to be legal. So it wasn't until I got a call from Debbie Clopton, my first client in homeschooling. Uh, she was in Lancaster, about 90 miles north of where we were in Santa Monica, California. And she had actually, <clears throat> interestingly enough, she came out from my home state. I was born and raised in Arkansas. Actually, I was born in Florida, but I was raised in the great state of Arkansas. And that's where she was from. But she had moved out to California. She had enrolled her three children in a public school. And her little girl, who was five or I think she was six, first grade, uh, she had been taught by her mom to pray over her food. So at lunch, she said a prayer. It wasn't an out loud, real out loud prayer, more of a silent prayer, but she bowed her head and prayed over her food. And the kids started pointing to her and said, you can't do that, making fun of her. And sure enough, the proctor came over the school, <clears throat> the uh, teacher that was responsible for monitoring the school the uh, <clears throat> dining hall came over and said, no, you can't do that. So her little daughter came home devastated. She was crying. Mommy, mommy, I, I can't pray over my food. What am I going to do? Well, Dovey was a fighter and she went down to that school and she grabbed that principal and the principal affirmed that she would not be able to pray in school. Well, that was incorrect. I mean, that's wrong, but D Davi wasn't going to wait around, so she pulled her kids out of school. Immediately, she got a letter from the district attorney threatening the prosecutor. Uh, they set up a hearing, and she called me. Now, how she found out about me, I'd done an interview shortly after we started homeschooling with the LA Times. And so people were beginning to find out that I was a lawyer, uh, I was homeschooling, maybe some free legal uh, representation. So with Dovey, I had to look up the law and basically in California, they were taking a position, unless you're a certified teacher, you couldn't homeschool. So that was my first case. I made an argument, a constitutional argument. I had to bring all of her books into the district attorney's office. They wouldn't look at them. They weren't interested in that. They just wanted her kids in school. And we said, well, we're not gonna be able to do that. So I guess you'll have to decide what you're gonna do. They left her alone. So that was my first case that I won a major victory, didn't even have to go to court. <laughs> and so with that, then I got involved in the leadership. There was an organization, uh, Chi of California that was just starting up and they asked me to be on their board. And I got involved in that. And then I met a fellow by the name of Mike Ferris at a, at a uh, conference, homeschool conference. And Mike was a lawyer in Washington state. He was having the same problems there, being able, trying to represent families one at a time. And so he came up with the idea of starting Homeschool Legal Defense Association. As a matter of fact, he already kind of had it mapped out. And he said, would you be willing to join me? And I said, uh, absolutely. I mean, what a great idea. I wish I had thought of it myself, but at any rate. So we started out <clears throat> and started HSLDA in 1983. Uh, the purpose of the organization was pretty clear we wanted to make homeschooling a fundamental right for every family that wanted to make that choice. And in the United States at that time, if you would have asked <clears throat> a whole series of attorney generals, uh, the chief lawyer for the state, 
whether homeschooling was legal or not in their state, <clears throat> excuse me, probably 40 to 45 of them would have said no. Maybe under some form, but you have to be a certified teacher. You have to be under the thumb of the school district. Your curriculum has to be approved. You have to get prior approval, uh, all those sorts of things. Well, the good news is today, if you were to poll 50 attorney generals, they would all say in their state, homeschooling is legal. So been a tremendous movement, the homeschool movement in America. Uh, one of the questions that was asked me is in starting an organization, uh, looking back, what were some of the important decisions that were made? And I would say what you have to, if you're thinking about starting an organization, you have to think what kind of organization do you want? So initially, uh, you'd have to decide, do I want to be for profit, profit, whatever your country has. But um, we did have some for profit organizations, state organizations that were homeschool organizations run by families. And, you know, they did well. But generally speaking, because this is a cause oriented um, organization, it would be for nonprofit, and that way you get um, the benefit of being taxed. Uh, you don't have, in the United States at least, you don't have to be taxed on the money that comes in, the revenue, and you get some benefits. The downside is you have to deal with the government, and the government is more intrusive every year. As a matter of fact, I tell people now, people in the homeschool community that don't necessarily want to start a, you know, a national or state organization, but some kind of an organ, maybe a school or whatever. Don't just automatically assume that you want to become a nonprofit because I, I don't, it, going forward, quite frankly, I'm not sure that's the wisest thing to do. But at any rate, you have to decide that. What kind of organization are you going to have? And the reason the nonprofits are actually good is because you want a multiplicity of counsel. And if people think you're actually making money from the organization, they're less likely to probably volunteer and help out. So HSLDA was a nonprofit tax exempt organization and that's how we started. The other issue, a main issue is how you're gonna fund that organization. Um, we chose to do a membership funding and still today 73% of HSLDA's revenue that funds our organization comes from membership. Now we have donations now, but here's another thought. If you can find someone in your country, some man, some organization, some woman that's really committed to it, or you can sell them on it, and they have some money, uh, getting a major gift to start is really important because you, what, what I've seen with organizations in the homeschool movement, many of them start out totally underfunded. I mean, they start out in faith. They assume it's all going to work out, but it doesn't all work out. You have to have, you have to plan. How are you going to meet your expenses? I mean, are you going to work full time, part time? What, what are you going to do? See, the United, in the United States, most of our state organizations, when they started out, were volunteer, all volunteer. Now, some of them got bigger and they were able to employ some people. But generally speaking, these were parents and they had decided this was an important thing for us. So they organize together. You have to find other like-minded people. You can't do this by yourself. You have to find other like-minded people that are willing to invest the time in it. You have to decide, am I going to be full-time? How much time am I going to spend? How is it going to be financed? We use membership. But if you can actually find someone who's willing to, to give you a lot of money to start out, that's great. But what you have to think about, how you're going to continue to finance that all the way through. Now, the state organizations were able to use the, con the, the conventions and that's becoming problematic. And some of the state organizations are challenged now financially because that was their major revenue source and the conventions are difficult now to get people to come out. That was a major decision for us. How are we gonna finance the organization? We chose to do it membership. I think for a legal organization, you need members. I really do, because you want people that are like-minded, that are willing to invest with you. They're your partners. Basically, that's it. They're your partners. They believe in freedom. They believe in liberty. They want to advance that, and they're willing to do it through their membership. The other thing about membership, 
in terms of being your financial vehicle is that members come up every year for renewal. Uh, and so if you automatically 60 or 70% will renew. And your donors, if you choose to do it through donors, you have to develop them. You have to continue to work with them, work on them, so to speak. Because it's not automatic that they're going to even give you another dime, right? So you just have to decide, but I think it's a, a combination of the two is very good. That's what we do today. But find a rep, you have to be able to support yourself. Because what you don't want to do is to start a legal organization and commit to these people and then not be able to follow through. Uh, that, that's devastating for folks. Uh, what else? Let's see. This is important. I think I mentioned it. But find like-minded people that you can work with. Without the state organizations, HSLDA would not have been successful. But with the state organizations working together, especially in the area of the legislatures, where basically in the United States and probably where you are, that's where your homeschool law is eventually going to end up. I mean, we're lawyers, we defended our families in court. We won some, we lost some, you don't win them all. You're going against the government, it's difficult. But in the legislature, that's where we saw the success and we have to have teamwork. You have to have, you know, you're gonna be, your office is gonna be someplace, but maybe the legislature someplace else and you have to have folks that you can network with, work with, and they're effective. Kevin Lundberg's gonna come on in a minute. <clears throat> and so like Colorado, for instance, Colorado has a good law, but they had to go through the legislature to get it. And the legislature was influenced by those homeschoolers in Colorado. And of course, a lot of our members helped out, but working in partnership, homeschooling, legal defense is not just your organ, cannot be just your organization. You're going to have to network with a group of leader, homeschool leaders around your country and work together to bring liberty and freedom. And there is so much dynamic in being able to get together and have this common purpose, this common cause. And as you continue through it, um, you'll have to be able to be willing to work for free perhaps or for a little for a while uh, till you figure it all out. And then just keep working at it as long as you have the passion for it. Mike, I think that would be all I have right now to, I think that's it. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much for those words of wisdom and sharing uh, the stories of how you got started. I really appreciate that a lot. And uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, so, uh, Karin. Von Oostrom, uh is the CEO of the Pestalozzi Trust from South Africa. Uh, and I met Karen uh, because I got to know her late husband, Lindert, um, who tragically passed uh, about five years ago. And Lindert was a tireless champion for homeschool freedom in South Africa, a tremendous individual. And, and he and Karen together homeschooled their numerous children in South Africa. And Karen, it's, it's just such a wonderful blessing to have you involved as a member of the Global Home Education Exchange Council um, and to be uh, part of this global movement. Uh, and of course, you know, HSLDA was involved a little bit in helping kick off uh, the Pestalozzi Trust, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that and maybe introduce yourself a little bit more and tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit more about your family, perhaps. And what did you learn from, from getting started uh, in, uh, in South Africa and what are some things you wish you had known um, that nobody, well, I guess maybe Chris Click had told you some things, but you've probably learned some things along the way. So please, Karen, would you please share with us? Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Mike. So um, I'm Karen van Oostrum um, and I really enjoyed listening to you, Mike Smith. Um, there are so many things that, that ring a bell <laughs> from when we started to. Um, so I'll tell you about ourselves, um, our story. So we were kick-started into homeschooling when our first child was born in 1988. Um, 
eventually all three of our children were homeschooled all the way and they only entered school as in the capacity of teachers. And nowadays they, they're all grown and um, some of them are still teaching and the last one is studying. But when back in 1988, we were, um, you know, that, that irresistible parental instinct kicked in, we, we changed our lives forever. And it also changed our life, view of society and of education. And so my husband, Leander, who was in the Navy at the time, he started studying education and learning um, intensively, so much so that he left the Navy and joined the University of Pretoria as an educational advisor. In the process, we, we learned so much about homeschooling. So in 1980. In 1992, we started the Association for Homeschooling with some like-minded um, parents that, that we've met in, along the way. And we started disseminating information about homeschooling and talking in, in the media. And Leander continued his studies and obtained his master's degree, uh, focusing on home education in the end. Um, but we, we learned a lot from those who've gone before us um, in the HSLDA and HSLDA Canada. And um, we benefited so much from the mentorship of and, and the friendship uh, extended by the, Lahaz, um, the International Liaison Department of the HSLDA and specifically uh, Dr. Chris Klicker and Mike Donnelly. And thank you for that. Um, by 1998, uh, the political and legal climate in South Africa changed drastically. So the association uh, requested its executive to establish an advocacy organization with teeth, uh, which would be able to defend its members' right in, to education in court, if necessary. The, there were no immediate red flags, but several orange flags were emerging endangering children's right to education to be determined and controlled by their parents. So by God's grace, the Pestalozzi Trust was founded in 1998. Uh, I always get questions about the name of the Pestalozzi Trust and the, the trust was named after Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi, uh, who advocated home education in the interest of the family as the basic unit of society. As stated in the Pestalozzi Trust deed, the object of the trust is to create a fund for educational purposes. And one of the primary objectives of the trust is to preserve um, the, fund the fundamental rights of Christian belief, I'm quoting here from the trust deed, as well as Christian family values and ways of education, and also to preserve for all children and families of whatever faith, the same fundamental religious, family and educational rights and freedoms as those claimed for Christians. So one of the, the first lessons that, um, that we've learned is um, with apology to Raymond and Dorothy Moore, better early than late. Don't procrastinate. The moment your first child is born, you are entered into a tug of war for your child's mind and heart. It's a war with very high stakes. And soon it becomes clear, even if you don't have an interest in politics, politics has an interest in you. For example, expressed in the slogan of the South African Department of Basic Education, which says, every child is a national asset. So if you want to be ready for the war, start early, long before the actual battle ensues. Start building your organization so that the foundations are solidly laid and get the scaffolding in place and start building and educating yourself and strengthening your organization and your members' knowledge and insight of all the issues at stake. Then one day, when the watchmen sound the alarm, you will be ready to calmly take on the battle. You will have prepared the necessary funds and expertise. Now, the question is always, now who should start an advocacy organization? The answer is any normal homeschooler, like, like my husband and I uh, were, anyone can do it. Yes, you can do it. The thing is, you need intimate knowledge and practical experience of home education. For a large part of your work will consist in consultations and mentoring and providing reliable information on the law and the practice of home education. 
So what is needed is someone who's willing to stand up for the rights of his family and for those of other homeschooling families. Someone with an unwavering inner conviction to protect his family and to go guard the education of his children. Even if you're not yet qualified as an attorney or advocate, people with these qualifications will eventually show up in your organization. Now, many parents will tell you, fortunately, I've never had any trouble. I've nothing to hide. So what are you worried about? So don't let them push you off your course. And other parents will be so fearful of standing up for their rights that it will demoralize them into inaction. And yet other homeschoolers will be jealous of you and try to taint your organization and obstruct your actions. But don't lose courage. Remember the Lord's word to Joshua and Joshua 1. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Pestalozzi's Trust started as a tiny organization with only a few members. But it is fine to start small. The mere fact that such an organization exists, small or large, will diminish and in large measure prevent aggressive government policies and actions. So although the Pestalozzi Trust is tiny and compared to our sister organizations, we fulfill a very important role in South Africa as a watchdog for home education and likely also for the many hybrid models of education uh, on the education scene. So even though you start small, in the end you will be able to secure freedom in education for millions of homeschoolers, for your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. What I wish I had known is how crucial research would prove to be. If I'd known that, we would have started doing much more research much sooner. Because policy and law should be research-based, and the sooner you start, the better. A few tips. Be generous in your calling and don't keep this to yourself. Train and mentor as many people as possible from all walks of life so that they can come to share your vision for freedom in education. And then reach out to homeschooling organizations in your country, to churches, to political parties, to the media, and reach out to organizations internationally like the HSLDA and HSLDA Canada and the GHEX to become part of an international network for mutual support and edification. And you'll be amazed at at how much one can actually learn from one another. Then trust the Lord. The Lord goes with you. When Joshua, as the new leader of Israel, was standing outside Jericho, a formidable city with many mighty warriors, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So the Lord speaks to you as well. Be brave and courageous. You're not alone. The Lord goes with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That was great. Uh, Succinct and helpful and a great perspective. Um, I really liked, uh, you know, what you uh, had to say about the trust document. You know, HSLDA is a Christian organization also, but we serve everyone. And uh, I think that uh, that's a common theme. You know, in some countries, there are lots of Christians who homeschool. In some countries, there are Muslims who homeschool. And, you know, I don't think there's lots of Jews that are homeschooling in any particular country, although there certainly are lots of them when you think about the Abrahamic religions, but there are many religions. And so people have lots of reasons for wanting to homeschool their children, some religious, some not religious. Uh, In the United States, uh, the number one reason that parents give for wanting to homeschool is concern about the environment in schools. You know, one of the founding principles of the Global Home Education Exchange Council is that we think that homeschooling is a human right, no matter how or why a person does it. It's just a right that parents should have to to choose to educate their kids for any reason, or frankly, for no reason. Uh, If they just want to do it, it should be their right to do it. So uh, thank you for that really encouraging um, presentation. And so let's turn to our next speaker, Kevin Lundberg, an, a, just a great friend. And Kevin, I've learned so much from you. And uh, I would say the same thing about you as I did about Mike is in terms of what I've learned from you as a mentor. And, uh, you know, you, you have been uh, engaged in the, the fight for homeschooling for so many years, right at the very beginning, really, uh, in Colorado. And I can't wait to hear your story. But You know, you served uh, both in the House of Representatives or the delegates or assembly, I'm not sure what you call it in Colorado, the House uh, in Colorado, and then you went over as a senator, and there are term limits in uh, both of those in Colorado, and, you know, you served the full term, 
you've run for Congress, uh, you continue to be involved in politics, trying to advance, uh, you know, freedom issues. Uh, you homeschooled your kids, uh, you and your wife, and you were instrumental in the founding of a state level organization. And so there are national organizations. We need to have national organizations. In some countries, the laws are national uh, in the United Kingdom. In France, uh, there are no provincial legislative bodies that have authority over education. But in countries like America, the United States of America, in Canada, Germany, uh, there are these are republics. Uh, the states have that authority. And so the state and local provincial organizations are incredibly important. So would you please share with us, uh, you know, your story, uh, how you got involved? And I, I've heard the long story, which is a great story. We don't have time for the great long story today, but uh, please share the highlights and, and the lessons that you've learned and that maybe the things that you wish you had known back then. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, but it was long enough. So thank you. Please share your wisdom with us, Kevin. Hey, thank you, Mike. I appreciate your kind words. However, don't expect any raise from me. Um, uh, that, that'll be up to Mike Smith. But <laughs> um, okay, yeah, uh, you I, can just buy me dinner next time I'm out in Colorado. Uh, well, okay, okay. I, I guess you're on. So the, <laughs> there you got me. <laughs> anyway, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, I was active with uh, and continue to be uh, uh, to, um, to somewhat of a degree uh, active with Christian Home Educators of Colorado. And it was over 30 years ago that uh, that we started that organization. But let me back up just a little bit. My story is very similar to everybody else's. Uh, I got involved in homeschooling because uh, my wife, uh, Sandy, and myself uh, uh, had uh, our firstborn was uh, looking at school age. And we had to figure out what what's the best circumstance for him. And uh, so we looked into homeschooling, got going that way. And, and, and the one thing I would bring out about that is everything that has to do with homeschooling organizational efforts is a very grassroots uh, system because people uh, get engaged not because they chose homeschooling as a profession but um, but because they saw it as the option for them and for their children um, and so you you look at all of the organizational efforts and they started at a, at a, at a very uh, a very germinal stage where it was just a group of parents who were trying to make it to work better for themselves. For us, for Sandy and I, when, when we first uh, looked into homeschooling, one of the things that was uh, very uh, effective was the small group, just a group of parents who'd gather maybe once a month or so to encourage one another to share resources, to uh, uh, do what they could to, uh, to make it better for their individual families. And, and that's what we got involved with. The particular homeschool group that we plugged in with happened to have a, a conference that, that was sort of seen as the state conference for Colorado. And um, through an odd set of circumstances, I ended up the uh, president of that group and discovered that we had this conference that, that uh, really reached out across the state. Uh, and I had uh, enough background in uh, organizational efforts, knowing that a small support group shouldn't be shouldn't be running a big statewide effort, and so we we uh, connected with other like-minded parents from around the state and and formed what what we called Christian Home Educators of Colorado, and uh, much has been said about how that develops. Uh, I I'd have one comment. To, uh, Mike Smith pointed out that with Homeschool Legal Defense Association, HSLDA, they're membership driven. Well, with CHECK, we chose a different path. Uh, we decided that, that uh, uh, I mean, initially it was a big conference and that's what we held and, and it got to be a pretty big conference for our uh, part of the country. Um, but that was just a, you might say one, one leg of a stool that needed at least three legs. So we diversified what we did and and uh, we we tried to start a second conference over in another part of the state and that worked for a few years but not very successfully but we started to branch out to other um uh, to other other efforts for example we we uh, started holding uh, uh, graduation ceremonies for homeschool kids this is something a lot of parents were looking for um uh, we eventually started a, an uh, an independent private school for homeschoolers and this um, 
works well within the laws of Colorado, uh, but that became a whole other area of, uh, of focus and, and a source of revenue as well, because uh, Mike's quite right that, that when you start organizations, especially from the ground up, um, uh, oftentimes you're, you're working in kind of a poverty level and you need to have a good plan that funds the effort. And as we diversified, as I say, we didn't choose membership. We chose to, to create a lot of programs that, that would have uh, fees associated with it. Some, some aren't. We have a homeschool day at the Capitol, and there we just invite everybody to come and make a statement to the legislature, which has been very effective. And we've been doing that for, uh, uh, oh boy, over 25 years now. Um, all of these things combined so that today Czech is, is a fairly substantial organization. We, we have um, uh, several people who uh, work full-time with the organization and, and uh, probably a couple dozen others who, who have a part-time uh, capacity, but some, uh, some stipend or, or, or uh, a salary is associated with it, and, and then hundreds and hundreds of people who are involved as volunteers at one level or another. And uh, we have found that that diversity really does go a long way. Um, I actually served as the executive director for Czech initially. And one of the principles I set up was whenever we launch into a new program, we've got to have a business plan where there's a little bit of a profit. I, I said, Let, let's, let's uh, make sure that we've got about a 10% margin at least so that we can pay the bills. And that has really served us well through the years so that each time we bring on a project, <clears throat> it, it actually enhances the overall organizational effort. Let's see. Let me cover a couple of other things if I could, too. Um, Mike mentioned that I served in the uh, Colorado legislature for, for several years. And um, actually, I got involved in that largely because I was engaged with homeschooling. Because when we started Check. Uh, we were just trying to serve the needs of the parents that were there. But, but uh, I remember we did a survey of those uh, folks uh, early on uh, just to say, okay, what do you think a state organization should be about? And uh, number one was to provide resources and, and support for individual families. But number two, and this was a very important one, was to protect the legal structure, to keep an eye on what's happening on the public sector, um, uh, to work with uh, homeschool legal defense uh, because they they were the real experts um, uh, you know Mike and Mike their attorneys well I'm not <laughs> but but I, I I did act like one down at the legislature for many years but um, you you need to be connected with with those folks and you need to be actively engaged in the decision makers lives uh, in your uh, in in Colorado, you you mentioned quite correctly that in the USA, USA uh, uh, we have a system of federalism, where each individual state has a great deal of responsibility and authority over the affairs of their citizens, and and so the state organizations really focus in on the state efforts uh, in uh, um, in their area. Uh, and so that was important, and and it was so important that I I got more and more plugged in, and finally realized you know I can do this, and so I ran for office. Um, took me a couple of times. You you've got to be uh, very committed to that, but got in there, and so I got to see it from that perspective as well, and to understand uh, the uh, the mindset of of the decision makers of the legislators, and and um, uh, I I recommend that. Uh, to some, not not to all, but I I do believe that in, in the homeschool community we need to not just interface with the government we we need to become some of those decision makers as well, and I know that varies dramatically from country to country, but as you can I recommend that you look around within the homeschool community and ask yourself who could do us um, uh, good service by being a part of the, the uh, government uh, uh, systems. Um, so that's another important area. L let, me, let me cover one other point, which um, there was a series of questions they wanted us to interact with. 
And one was, uh, do you have any regrets? Would you have done anything differently in your uh, work with homeschool organizations and, and efforts? And, and there is one thing that stands out to me. Remember that <clears throat> we got into this because we wanted the best interest of our, of our family. We wanted to be able to train our kids. And I always told uh, new homeschoolers and continue to do this, that when you take on homeschooling, Understand, you're, you're doing it for a variety of reasons, to help your child uh, uh, improve academically, maybe to get them out of an environment in, in the school system that you didn't like, or, or for some other specialized reason, but realize you'll probably accomplish that. But the real important thing you'll do is you'll change your life, your family's life, and your child's life forever. And that will be a very positive step if you're diligent and you keep at it. As Sandy and I went through developing Czech, the uh, homeschool organization. Sometimes our family was <clears throat> put on second uh, priority, and I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um, <clears throat> I now we took all, all of our kids all the way through homeschooling, and then they had successful uh, uh, times in in college and and careers at this point. But in looking back, I. Uh, I wish we would have put a little higher priority on our individual family rather than uh, setting it aside for all of the things that we had to accomplish uh, with the homeschool organization. Now, you're going to have to put some time and really invest in that organizational effort, but, but get your priorities straight from the beginning all the way to the end, and, and I believe that you'll, you'll find a great success uh, every direction. And, you know, as they say, if looking back, I'd, I'd spend a little more time with the family and a little less time with, with a check if I had to do it all over again. Kevin, that's just the kind of wisdom that I think every leader needs to hear. Thank you so much for sharing decades of so such varied experience from starting an organization, homeschooling your family, uh, making public policy. I mean, you were the homeschool champion. I mean, you were much more than just a homeschool champion. You championed so many other causes that were important to you and so many other people. But, uh, you know, we knew that with Kevin Lundberg uh, on the wall watching that the homeschoolers would know what was going on. And we had some there who we knew would fight. And we have some people like that still in the legislature. Uh, but you were singular in that. Yes, please go ahead. Would you allow me that that brings up one other point? I promise not to take long on this, but, but replicate oh, yourself because you're not going to be there forever. Um, and I actually think of this in terms of, uh, I'm going down to a conference with state legislators uh, uh, later this week, and I'm going to meet with uh, three people who I've had some role in replicating, uh, uh, two of them in their state legislatures and another one who is now the uh, legisl the government relations director for Czech. Um, so that's another important component is, is even as you can't do it all yourself, you need to find others who can and and look down the road and ask yourself, okay, when it's time for me to step aside from this, who's coming up behind me? Well, again, Kevin, yeah. tremendous wisdom. Um, you know, as leaders, we always need to be thinking about that because, you know, if an organization is dependent on one person, well, that organization, you know, is only one heartbeat away from going out of existence. Uh, none of us are guaranteed another day, another another breath, and uh, you know, and building into people and in our children, our family, and also leaders that we work with is so important, and that's how we can really make sure that the vision that we have carries on. And and you've done that, and thank you for that really important reminder. I really appreciated what you had to say. Um, so thank you. Uh, and next we'll be turning to Alexi Komov. Alexi is uh, a great friend. Um, I so vividly remember meeting Alexi the first time. And, uh, you know, when I had heard that there was homeschooling in Russia, um, which I, I couldn't believe that, um, you know, back in 2010, uh, I, I met some people and they said there's homeschooling in Russia. I'm like, there's homeschooling in Russia? Are you serious? This is a post-communist country. I mean, do they even know what homeschooling is? And uh, Alexi will tell you probably a little bit about the history, but homeschooling has been around from the founding of the Russian Republic which is pretty cool. But, you know, I grew up in the Cold War. I served in the army and uh, I, you know, I trained to, to fight Russians in battle. 
Uh, yet I went to Moscow in 2017, well, 2014 for the first time. And I, I, would, I went there and I went to the Kremlin and I looked around and I, I, pinching yourself would not do it justice because I was in the building where the Russian, the, the Soviet Politburo met. I was on the top floor where all of the top party officials met. And I was sitting there looking at what was incredible to me. This it was a it was a conference that wasn't about homeschooling. It was about family, but homeschooling was was part of it. And I was there to talk about homeschooling in the Kremlin, in the building where the Politburo met. And I said, "This is incredible, from communism to freedom." And you know, every country has their issues. And you know, the press in our country loves to you know bash Putin, and maybe he deserves a lot of it. Who knows? But the point is that you, you see a country that went from being a totalitarian state, communist state, where homeschooling would be impossible. And today you see homeschooling as part of, of the very founding of the country and a growing movement. And to me, that's pretty incredible, pretty exciting to hear about. And so I'm, I'm really excited to hear um, Alexei Komov's uh, sharing his story, his, his experience, a wonderful family. Uh, so, Alexi, please share with us for a few minutes, and then we will get to your questions. Uh, everybody's doing great, keeping time. Thank you, speakers. And uh, we will have a few questions here, and we'll probably wrap up maybe between 10.30 or so. So, Alexi, please, please take the floor and uh, please share with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, that was really amazing moments uh, in 2014 when we indeed had this uh, World Congress of Families, this great family gathering in the Kremlin where the big, big congresses of the Communist Party of, of the Soviet Union were taking place. And there we were defending traditional uh, family values. And uh, World Congress of Families is probably the largest platform, international platform that unites uh, advocates of, uh, uh, of pro-family values and homeschooling included from over 85 countries. And before that, three years before, we have arranged uh, another event. It was called Moscow International Demographic Summit, Family and the Future of Humankind. And interestingly enough, it was held uh, in the uh, building of former Institute of Marxism-Leninism. <laughs> that was the headquarters of uh, uh, global Marxism-Leninism. And then it was turned into a, a, a Russian social university and they have built a church uh, inside uh, this uh, uh, campus. And uh, we had an international meeting of uh, uh, American, European, global, uh, pro-family leaders there and was also pretty amazing. Uh, so this is how I got started uh, with homeschooling. I have learned about it through the wider conservative pro-family movement, uh, which I was uh, trying to uh, develop relations with. And uh, uh, my wife, Irina, uh, she was more involved in uh, uh, educating our kids. And we have seen the real homeschoolers from US and they were behaving like uh, normal people, uh, like well-educated people, like adults, uh, wh while they were teenagers. And we thought, well, we want uh, the same for our kids. And then uh, uh, Irina started to follow the school curriculum, but at home uh, with our uh, uh, oldest uh, son. But then it turned out that uh, it, it, it was not very effective. So we started looking uh, for any good curriculums, uh, particularly done for homeschooling. And we found classical conversations and we agreed to adapt and launch uh, this uh, uh, wonderful program uh, in Russia, which we did. Uh, and last uh, five years, we have uh, developed the, our communities in over 115 cities and villages and small towns from Pacific coast of Russia all the way to Baltic Sea, Black Sea, also in Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, in order to promote uh, homeschooling, which is legal from 1992, uh, as Mike has mentioned, uh, we have arranged a global home education conference uh, in our two major capitals, in two major cities, in St. Petersburg 
and in Moscow. And we have invited several members of parliament uh, uh, of both uh, Duma and the Federation Council, the upper chamber as well. Uh, Senator Mizulina, who is uh, the key person for family policy in Russia. She spoke there and we couldn't stop her. <laughs> she went over time limits, remember, Mike? <laughs> she was so uh, in favor of homeschooling, we, we couldn't believe that was a big success, really. And then uh, it gave a, a serious uh, boost uh, for to grow homeschooling and uh, it, it has grown. Uh, there are different estimates uh, uh, that it is over 100,000. Uh, it, it has been like this several years ago. Now probably it's 150,000 or more. Uh, there are no official statistics, but we see more and more people joining. In order to get uh, a, a legal protection, we have established a National uh, Homeschool Association of Russia several years ago. And we also have membership as HSLDA, so we were <clears throat> looking for best practices uh, and uh, we have established it. And now uh, today we're just polishing and uh, finally posting on our website, the document uh, regulating the regional representatives of uh, our association in different states and regions of Russia. And uh, because there are many people willing to, to do it. <clears throat> also, we have the uh, legal support for them. So we post some uh, frameworks, how to get your documents right. So state doesn't uh, interfere, uh, uh, doesn't have an excuse to interfere uh, into uh, homeschooling practices. And uh, uh, if there are difficult cases, we deal with them uh, on one by one basis and give more uh, in-depth legal advice and go to courts even. We have some good lawyers. Uh, so uh, this is uh, National Association of Homeschooling. Uh, when uh, there are attempts to over-regulate or restrict homeschooling, and they appear from time to time, basically every year, so some politicians, they start, oh, why don't we you know, regulate more? Homeschooling is growing again. Usually it happens in September when many don't go to school. They, there is a series of articles in mass media saying, oh, uh, schools are, are doing bad. They're, they're shooting in the school. Every month there are some shooting. They're looking at America, I guess. <laughs> this, this is not the best practice. This is the worst practice, but they do shooting in Russia in the schools as well. Anyway, uh, so people <clears throat> uh, become homeschoolers and they get uh, uh, you know, concerned politicians. So Nash, our association helps to represent all the homeschooling community in dialogue with the state and argue that it's a respectable form of education that gives good results and it should be respected. Also, we have established uh, maybe five years, four or five years ago, a homeschool support center to give uh, online uh, tests. Uh, for the parents, if, if they're willing to have uh, some papers saying that they have passed uh, this grade, fifth grade, and so the state cannot uh, ask too many questions. So this is basically what I wanted to say. Uh, also promote homeschooling at different conferences. Just today I was in the center of Moscow speaking at some rather important uh, conference and I mentioned homeschooling again. A week ago, I returned from the trip uh, through south of Russia, Caucasus, where we had this global gathering of all Russians, they call it. It's a pretty influential organization. There again, I argued for homeschooling. There was some opposition, but it became part of a, a larger uh, patriotic, conservative, uh, pro-family movement in Russia as well. So we tried to mainstream it and become respectable with the help of all of you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak, Mike. Well, Alexi, thank you so much for everything that that you are doing, and I, I value our friendship. And uh, you know, it's just incredible. I think about you know, you grew up during communist times. You were there. You experienced what it was like to be, uh, you know, in the Soviet Union, and uh, you know, now to see homeschooling happening in a place that was was so oppressive in so many ways uh, as it relates to those issues is is very encouraging and and to see this kind of connection between you know here here I am an american who grew up in the army training to fight against the russian army in the in the plains of europe and you know we've we we we've, we've talked together i've I, you know you've introduced me to 
some of the men who were officers in the Soviet army at that time who would have been my enemy and, and to see the relationship that we've been able to develop uh, and the friendship, uh, you know, it shows that homeschooling is an issue that cuts across so many different lines of religious beliefs, political beliefs, philosophical beliefs. And, and that's what we're trying to do with GHEX. And I appreciate your participation on the board. We had an incredible conference there in, in Russia. And um, it shows that, that parents everywhere are yearning to do what's best for their children. And that home education is what, as you said, should be respected and respectable. And, and so we are working together for that. So th I wanna thank the speakers. We're gonna turn to some questions now. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of people who are currently attending right now, listening, but we are going to be posting this recording. And I think this is going to really help a lot of people who are thinking about starting homeschool organizations because the, the lessons learned, the wisdom, the advice that has been shared here has been incredible. Um, so let's, let's get practical here for a minute. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Bowie. Bowie, it's great to have you on here. You're asking great questions, so thank you. Um, Bowie asks, many homeschool organizations, and Kevin, this is gonna be a question for you because I think you and, and then maybe Alexi uh, or Karen, of course, um, not HSLDA because we don't use volunteers as much because the question is, how can you recruit volunteers? Many homeschool organizations use a lot of volunteers. It's important. Um, what are some tips on getting getting volunteers involved, and Kevin, you're already chuckling. Why don't you why don't you right. kick us off? Because I know you've uh, grappled with this issue a lot. Well, yeah, you know, Czech started as volunteers entirely, uh, and uh, then uh, we found very quickly that we needed to put some people on more of a staff situation. But I developed a little uh, saying, uh, which is Czech is volunteers. I wanted everybody who's involved with the organization to understand that this is a labor of love first and foremost. Uh, it, it's something you need to throw yourself into because you want to be there. And then a second thing we did, and this is something my wife Sandy really established when she uh, was the conference coordinator for a few years, is we invested in our volunteers. Now, volunteers giving you their time and their talents and so many things, but we needed to turn back and bless them as much as possible. So we made them, you know, try to make them feel like a million bucks, you might say, um, by supporting them. Uh, and and it, it paid off every direction. People were happy to be involved and it built a big, strong uh, team that continues on for literally decades. But, but you start with that principle that the organization is essentially volunteers. And if they're staff, the staff support the volunteers, but the volunteers get the work done. Um, and, Kevin, and let, me, you, let, me press, yeah. let me press in on that just a little bit, because um, what does that look like? Because I've been to some Czech, uh, I've been to Czech events for a number mm -hmm. of years, and you guys have a fantastically run organization. Uh, you have so many volunteers and they're so organized, but practically, what does it look like to support volunteers and to show that you value volunteers? Like, how do you well, do that practically? Uh, well, let, let, let me talk about the, uh, the, the conference volunteers where they really have a, a, a big job to do in a short amount of time for the most part. I mean, you know, it all builds up to that conference. And by short amount of time, I mean weeks, not, not hours. Uh, but um, we try to look at each individual volunteer and, and ask ourselves, how can we help them? Like if there's some lady who is, uh, or, or mom or dad or both, who are, you know, he heading up the uh, exhibit hall, which is a big job that requires a lot of structure and organization. First, you've got to find people who are competent and qualified to do it. And, and a lot of that is you sort of develop a farm team, you might say. You bring people in, you encourage them, you watch them, you see if they'll do better in a bigger job, and then you, you give them that job down the road but you also ask yourself how can we help them we would give some a stipend not not to pay them for their services but to just you know help mom go maybe maybe grab some uh, pizza for the night for their kids because they were busy that afternoon working on you know the conference stuff things like that and, and also uh intentionally appreciate them uh, one of the things we've we've done through the years is for people who've been volunteering for several uh, or or for more than one year, we'll <clears throat> we'll give them 
special recognition for uh, <clears throat> how long they've been involved and, and maybe some little, you know, some little token of some sort uh, that, that would be of value to them. Um, so we invest in them. You know, maybe it's going to cost you uh, $50,000 a year to, to keep a part-time person going. Well, how about if you take five grand and really put it into that volunteer? Now, that, that's kind of an extreme side, but in another sense, it isn't um, because, you know, send them to another conference. We've done that for several people. As a matter of fact, Alexei, you, you, you talked about uh, what's happening there in Russia. Uh, Czech actually sent a family to Russia to, to uh, see how the homeschool environment was going. And, and that was a, a pretty big investment for the organization, but it, 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 it paid off in so many ways. Um, both for the organization and for that family that went there and, and had that, that uh, uh, very, in, you know, uh, significant experience uh, with uh, seeing what is happening in the homeschool world there in, in uh, Moscow. And I think they went to St. Petersburg. Alexi, any thoughts on volunteers? I know there were a lot of volunteers at the Global Home Education Co Exchange Council conference we had back in 2018. How did you get all yeah. this? Yes, there were there, there were many because excitement was uh, so high about those uh, this global home education conference and uh, so many brilliant speakers coming from so far away. So when the excitement is there and when there is something unique you offer, there would be some volunteers. And we have a core group of uh, really very dedicated uh, parents, families uh, that who love homeschooling. Uh, so we can uh, rely on them uh, for help. Uh, but we are lucky. In, in general, uh, I would say that uh, during 70 years of communist rule, they, they abused uh, the volunteers as, as a, uh, you know, as a movement because they everything was you suppose you were supposed to work for free or for very small money and uh, everybody was supposed to volunteer in some ways and it was artificially pushed from above so people got uh, tired of this so it, after a collapse of soviet union first uh, 10 uh, uh, 10 years i would say at minimum people were not uh, willing to volunteer they were enjoying free market enterprise, although in some wild way in the 90s, but then it became more <laughs> normal. And uh, now there are some volunteers, but this is a younger generation that was born after communism. The older generation, uh, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they have still some memories that volunteer, volunteerism was uh, done in, in, in a pretty wrong way, an abusive way before. But now, yes, I think the, the key thing is that to have a really important cause uh, for volunteers and uh, uh, if, if they're really motivated by their Christian beliefs, by their values, then it gives you a long-term uh, group of people on whom you can rely on as volunteers. And we're really happy and blessed to have those people in homeschooling in Russia. Thank you, Alexei. I appreciate that. I think that's true uh, of any organization homeschooling. I mean, it's there are businesses that can generate revenue, um, you know, curriculum, conferences can generate revenue, but um, it's not a business. Homeschooling is not a business um, itself. It's a, it's, a, it's a movement. It's a cause. It's a, it's a form of education that we do as parents because we think it's best and we take it on, you know, and this is, you know, there's a discussion happening in many countries about, about funding and money. In our country, in the United States, we're arguing over you know, should the government fund private education? Um, in, in some countries, the government funds everything and, and what the government funds, the government controls. So, you know, this is a conversation we need to have. And so, you know, having volunteers uh, to help support organizations is, is, and events is important. Um, Mike, I'd like to turn uh, this next question to you. Another great question um, from Bowie. Great question, Bowie. Bowie asks, your definition of a member, he wrote, or as you said, Mike, is someone who supports the cause that benefits um, the, the collective or the whole movement, so to speak. Um, how is that different from a donor, he asks? And, you know, are there some benefits to the member as an individual? So, Mike, could you talk a little bit about this? Because you've been so involved in this, uh, you know, because we have members at HSLD. We also have donors. Uh, sometimes there's some legal distinctions, but 
you know, how, how do you think about that question? Well, our members, when we started membership, the idea was that a family would be able to join HSLDA and then they would, they would have a benefit, which would be representation. And that was the amazing part of what we were able to do. Initially, we started out at $75 a year. You could have a lawyer for 24 7, 365, which is pretty amazing. Today, the average uh, member at HSLDA pays about $120 for the same thing. So a membership has benefits. As a result, that's not a donation because you're receiving a benefit. A donor simply makes a donation. And for that, they get nothing other than the their satisfaction in giving, quite frankly, but also the satisfaction of being a supporter. Many of our members are donors. As a matter of fact, most of our donors are members. Now they're exceptions. And in order to be a member, you have to qualify. Basics is pretty simple. You have to either support homeschooling or be a homeschooler to be a member. And with that, you get benefits. That's the difference. We have other benefits other than membership. We have access to our consultants as a result and, and other benefits as a result. So that's the major difference. Well, HSLDA has created a whole host of benefits uh, for, for our members over the years. Initially, it was just being able to talk to a lawyer who could possibly keep you from going to jail. Uh, over time, we've added, <laughs> we've added some additional benefits. Uh, and there's lots of benefits uh, that, you know, an organization can, can diversify itself yeah. with to attract members um, and generate revenue, as Kevin, you were talking about. So thanks for, right. for clarifying that, Mike. Uh, Karen, I wonder, um, does the Pestalozzi Trust have members or donors or both? We have members, and we also have a, a small number of donors, but we don't li really um, look for donors or for donations. So it's not as if we advertise and, you know, the donations welcome and so on. So we're basically a membership organization. Well, Mike, we were kind of like that once upon a time. Can you talk a little bit about yes. that, con that, that transition that we've had over the years? Yes, we realized, however, that in order to keep our membership, what I would call reasonable, so people wouldn't really have to worry about paying a lot of money to become a member, we needed to raise some uh, additional funds outside of membership. And that's the reason we started our donor emphasis. And that's become a major thing now because our members, uh, many of them want to give beyond just their membership fee. And that's really something that we want to give them the opportunity to do that. And so, as I said, about 30% now of our revenue comes from donors. They're giving because they want to support the mission and the mission is freedom. That's really how you, in my opinion, donors want to give to a cause and many of them will give just to homeschooling and that's true. But what we're seeing now with our freedom fund is there are many of our members that see, they, they want this freedom to exist for their children and their grandchildren. And they see by giving extra to HSLDA that they're supporting an organization that stands for that proposition. So membership is our staple, no doubt about it. And it will continue to be our staple. And our membership is growing, as you know, because of what's going on with COVID, et cetera. But I think donors are important to give people an opportunity uh, to give if you know they want to. Uh, we don't twist arms, but we give opportunities. Mike? I wonder if I could uh, jump in on please, this a little yes, bit. Please uh, jump in and then I'm going to ask Alexi to comment also. Okay. Well, I just, just wanted to say that, uh, that as I no noted initially, that the check didn't start with a membership basis. We actually did that uh, on uh, uh, some local counsel we got on uh, sort of the legal construction of uh, will the organization be driven by the opinions of the members or the opinions of the board. And, uh, and yet through the years, we have migrated towards some forms of membership in that the uh, private school really are member families for that component of check. Um, uh, but uh, you have to look at the legal structure in your jurisdiction and figure out um, what, what fits and what works. And, and members and donors, those, those can be interchangeable as, as Mike yeah. has, has noted. Let, let me go a little bit further there. One of the things we chose not to do was to give our members a vote. Some of the state organizations right. have had a lot of problems with that. They can't even get a quorum. And when they do, they have chaos on their hands because then you have a take attempt to take over. So if you're going to start a membership organization, do not make it democratic. 
our board basically sets the policy. Members have input, but they don't have votes. That's important. Right. And that will work in some countries and in other countries, they want to do things differently. And well, I get it. And, and you know what? Actually, in some places, they may you may have to give them members a vote. So far, we have, <laughs> I, I can just tell you, we love our members, but having these meetings that some of these state organizations and what I've seen, they, ha- they rue the day they actually gave members votes. <laughs> it sounds great. I've, I've, I was a state leader in one of those organizations um, where we you know, needed to get uh, you know, people together uh, at one time. But you know, it's not, you know, it may sound to some people like, oh yeah, we, the you know, people who know everything, we're going to make the decisions and we're going to do what we think is best. There's an element of that, but not really arrogantly. It's because of the transaction costs in some ways, as you talk about, Mike, this quorum, needing to get a quorum. I mean, people are busy. They're living their lives. They're homeschooling their kids. That's a lot. And yeah. then to ask them to get interested in a civic organization and take their time to get up to speed, to travel to wherever they have to go. I mean, I guess we don't have to travel these days, but whatever, take time to invest in, in, in learning enough about the issues and then make an informed decision. That's a lot for people to be able to do. And so uh, I think this is great. I really appreciate you know the conversation here about members, donors. Uh, Alexi, how are you guys doing it in Russia? How's it working for you? Yes, we also have to uh, keep in mind some potential risks in terms of uh, long-term uh, uh, management of this association because uh, by law, uh, uh, we have the association uh, and uh, we, we need to have uh, annual meetings where everybody needs to, to vote uh, or through online or uh, through Zoom. Uh, but it, it, we need some paperwork done and uh, it, it can get out of control if you uh, let it happen in, in, in a bad way. I mean, we, we let everybody speak. Uh, we, we try to hear as many opinions as possible, but uh, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the goal. So we need to be uh, ready to defend uh, homeschooling and we need uh, uh, you know, the, the right organization for it. And uh, yes, we have membership. Uh, we don't have donors uh, so far, but uh, probably in the future we would have it in this nas- national association of homeschooling. In terms of curriculum, uh, you know, it works a uh, different way that people pay to participate in the, in the program and they buy books and that's how you live. This is a, a for-profit uh, arm of it. In terms of online testing, it's a separate uh, third uh, type of uh, arrangement where people uh, pay, uh, I don't know, $100, $200 per year to get online online testing. And it's pretty easily done. So we want to create uh, 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 the least amount of problems for, uh, and troubles for homeschoolers to pass those tests if they choose to do it. So this is what we do more or less. Well, you mentioned testing. Uh, testing is something in some countries and some populations of people they want to do. And I, I think that can be a very good business. Um, so you know, it is a very good. Business. Yeah, Guzel is developing it very well. Now they have eight thousand members. They're they're doubling every year. Wow, that is incredible. That's so exciting. Uh, you know, I don't know if we had eight thousand members within two years of the organization starting, Mike, in the beginning. Oh. Did we? No, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, um, nice. So our final question um, comes from Sandrine, who um, I think every one of us can comment on this. Um, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe Kevin, this has to do with um, government. So maybe we can start with you and then we'll go around. Um, how do you work? Her question is this, and how do you work with, an administra- with administrations or administrators when they want to ban homeschooling? Now, I don't think you have that in Colorado, but maybe if it's not ban, maybe it's restrict, maybe it's hostile to. So what are, what are some advice you have based on your years and years of experience working with executive, the executive branch in Colorado on how to work with these administrations or administrators when they are hostile to homeschooling and trying to impose regulation on it? Well, my, my, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, very carefully. Um, uh, in other words, don't come crashing in and think you're going to fix everything. First, establish some good relationships. Get to know who's who's doing what and, and find out why they uh, have the opinions they do. Uh, sometimes you need to be either 
Uh, down at the state capitol in Colorado, I always say that homeschooling needs to either be respected or feared. <laughs> um, or both. <laughs> yeah, or both. And honestly, I, I mentioned that we have a homeschool day at the Capitol. We'll, we'll bring about a thousand people down there uh, every year and have a big rally. And uh, the legislators will come out and either be friends with us or they'll they'll kind of tiptoe around knowing that that's a big, uh, you know, lion that you better not uh, uh, poke at too much. Uh, so uh, get engaged, get involved. I talked about people. Uh, homeschoolers becoming a part of the system, that's an important component as well. But, and, and we've had them in Colorado, people who want to uh, restrict us, you know, regulate us to death, basically. Uh, and, and so you've got to stay on top of it. You've, you've got to work hard all the time. Uh, eternal vigilance is necessary as well. Well, freedom isn't free. Uh, it comes with a cost, and and that's uh, true in, in in different uh, different ways as well. And one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan, said, "We don't pass freedom on, you know, uh, to the, you know our future generations in the bloodstream. Every generation has to fight for it and and defend it right. and win it." Um, and you said, uh, you know, you have to be careful. Sometimes you can't come crashing in, but sometimes Mike Smith, you have to come crashing in and maybe even crash phone lines. Tell, yeah. tell us about how homeschoolers uh, became feared and therefore respected in, in the United States once upon a time. We had a battle in 1994, 94 or 2004, Mike. 94. Yeah, 94. 94, yeah. there you go. HR 6. We had a, value, a, a battle with Congress because there was a threat to actually the federal government trying to regulate indirectly. What, there was a bill that basically would have required all teachers to be certified teachers. Uh, it was in a 1,200-page bill, and it was one paragraph in there. And some homeschool moms spending a lot of time on the internet at night caught it. We didn't catch it. HSLD is monitoring all this legislation. She got it. Dick Army, who was a legislator in Texas at the time, she called him. He called us and says, is this a problem? <laughs> we said, yes, this is a major problem. We couldn't get the author of the bill to just put public school in front of that. That would have solved the whole problem. But when he refused to do that, over a million homeschoolers called into Congress, jammed up the switchboard for a week, jammed up our switchboard, tremendous outpouring. And when the vote came down, it was 413 to one against that bill. That kind of established, at least in the federal side in Congress, that homeschool, you don't want to mess with them, okay? Uh, they will ruin your day, they'll ruin your week, they'll ruin two weeks if they have to, whatever. But I'd like to make a distinction between legislative, uh, which uh, I think Kevin is an expert at, legislative, um, what we call lobbying for homeschooling, and the administrative uh, branch. That's the executive branch. This is much more difficult to deal with, uh, but we can make it painful for them too. And sometimes you have to. But I, like Kevin, I would urge relationships wherever you can. And so what we do here in the U.S. and across the states, of course, is we try to get our families to go in and visit these legislators when they're not in session. Uh, when they're in session and we bombard them, you know, they have a lot of other things going on, a lot of other bills to consider. But building relationships with legislators and, if you can, other administrators in the executive branch is really important because many of these legislators, many, certainly years ago, they didn't even know what homeschooling, they don't know what a homeschooler is. They might have a perception that a homeschooler is a religious, weird, right wing, wacko. And so I think relationships, developing those outside of the time when we are then calling on them if, if a bad bill and then we're threatening them, et cetera. A relationship is important. As far as the administration side, Mike, that, that's more difficult. I believe, but relationships are important. That's where the leadership in the state organizations and HSLDA come in. We need to develop those where we can. Uh, those relationships are very, very important. If it doesn't work, then we have to call out the army, the forces. And that works actually pretty well. <laughs> That's painful for the legislators and, and the administrators. Well, they don't like that, and the homeschool community yeah. in the United States has has done that um, on occasion when necessary, and only yeah. when necessary. And it does; it's it's a painful thing for the legislature because they don't want drama. 
They don't like drama. I mean, some of them like drama, but generally if you're trying to get stuff done in government and you've got thousands of people coming to the Capitol, thousands of phone calls and emails, that kind of that messes up your day. And so they, they like to avoid that. Um, but the administrators, executives, Mike, you're right. I mean, I, I have, um, you know, working for uh, HSLDA in, in, within the United States and a number of states, uh, developed relationships with the different departments of education, working with our state partners, of course. And, um, you know, that is so helpful. Um, you know, Kevin, you talked about relationships and you talked about reasons. And I think those are two key things. Um, you develop relationships by understanding person's reasons for wanting to do something. And uh, when, when a person knows that, that you're open to hearing what they have to say, then maybe they'll be willing to listen to what you have to say. Right. And, go ahead, Kevin. Well, and, and in terms of the legislative side, you, you know, here in the U.S. at least, you, uh, you, you can't force your way in. Um, Sometimes you have to work with uh, somebody who maybe you wouldn't agree with on any other issue, but if you can get, uh, if you can understand who they are and what they're about, sometimes you can find some common ground with them, and that's where you can you can get things done that direction. Um, and and I'm going to go back and really emphasize that that long-term plan is put your own people in those positions. When I was the assistant majority leader, I ran a resolution in support of homeschooling, and I looked around the room and I realized that the president of the Senate, the majority leader of the Senate, and myself, the assistant majority leader, were all homeschooling dads. Now, we got something done then. <laughs> yes, you did. And we, we, we had a lot of battles, and we still have battles in Colorado. Uh, <laughs> Karen, you know, you've been dealing with um, the, a bill in South Africa, which, which offers some challenges. It's not banning homeschooling, but it could severely regulate homeschooling. What's been your experience um, on this? And then Alexia, I'd like to ask you to comment. And then I think we're going to wrap up with some final comments. So when the, the Bella bill, it's, we, it's called the Bella bill. Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill, which was published in 2017. There were so many comments from homeschoolers that we actually stopped, we blocked the, the, um, the Department of Basic Education's servers and uh, the, um, the advocate in a... Uh, uh, um, what's his name again? He, he was in charge of everything. He just disappeared. He said he was just going down to the Eastern Cape for a while because he can't handle this. His, his, his computer is blocked. No, no, nothing is working. So they, they did actually take, take notice of us very well. So we had many laughs about that. Yeah. Well, so we're that's... still fighting it. It's now um, the the bill is now in cabinet, and then it's then it would go to parliament. So the, this we're still fighting it all the way. That's an important thing that a homeschool legal defense organization can do is watching what the legislature is doing and being a voice uh, for the homeschool community um, and to you know be a voice back to the homeschool community. Alexi, final final words on. Um, on, on this issue and any final words, and we'll go back around and wrap up our session together. Yes, it's very important to keep the finger on the pulse of what they're uh, contemplating on in legislative uh, uh, bodies and, and parliaments. And when there is a, a, a bill restricting homeschooling, we need to react. And there are different uh, uh, faces of our movement that we can uh, present first is a very kind face uh, with a nice uh, tie and uh, very polite and we come and uh, speak to them and uh, present the good good examples of homeschooling and try to stress that it's really a, a very respectable uh, thing and it's a global human right and we try to uh, argue in this way. At the same time, uh, it, it helps also to establish some online petitions uh, and we have a Citizen Go platform for this. And uh, now there are talks to establish also an open platform like uh, ActRight uh, that you have in, uh, in the US. 
So we are thinking to make a Russian platform where anybody can launch a petition as long as it matches the wider uh, conservative pro-family values. We're in the process of launching this, a very wide initiative. So, uh, and the copy of this online petition, uh, they go to the member of parliament who, who is initiating this bad law uh, to president, to prime minister, to, to everyone involved. And it adds pressure because it is something concrete. So when you can present a hundred thousand uh, uh, signatures with uh, individuals saying that don't do it, 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 they don't want troubles. So they say, oh, okay, maybe there will be a lot of noise. The people will be, you know, against it. Uh, so maybe we should amend it. And uh, hopefully it works. So it should be push and pull. So you need to work on, from different directions and then hopefully it works. And then the church as well, it's important to involve uh, also religious organization uh, and maybe some advocacy groups and uh, good analytics. So partner, partnering with other organizations, like-minded, having tools, these are all things that I, you know, are some things that a legal defense organization can and should do. Um, Kevin, any final, any final comments as we wrap up our time together here? Well, just one quick uh, note. I really appreciate uh, some of the particular things that uh, Karen brought to our attention. And, and one thing stands out to me, and that was uh, her phrase that said, just do it. Uh, don't stand back and be timid. Uh, grab the bull by the horns and go after it. That's how each one of these organizational efforts have started up. You're, you're going to learn a lot on the way. But you're going to get something done if you step up and make it happen and, and, and trust in God's guidance and direction, too. Because if, if, if he's not uh, um, in, engaged and involved in what you're doing, you're doing the wrong thing. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, Mike, any final words as we wrap yeah. up our time together here? Just following up on what Kevin said, I really appreciated what he said about it's really important that as you get into this and you work very hard and you'll do a lot of volunteer work and whatever, that your family still remains first because that is really the key to this. The other is that it's a, whenever you start anything, it's a risk. But if the cause is right and you've got the support of others, I would never try to do this by yourself, but if you have the support of others that agree with you and they're willing to work with you in partnership, it's, it's definitely worth doing and it will likely be successful. Well, those are really great comments. So I'd like to thank our speakers, Mike Smith, president of HSLDA, Kevin Lundberg, uh, former senator from the state of Colorado, Karin von Oostrom, CEO of the Pestalozzi Trust, and Alexei Komov, uh, in charge of a variety of organizations in, uh, and working on organizations and homeschooling in Russia. My friend, all of you, uh, dear friends, and, and appreciate all of the work that you're doing. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today for our session. Um, we, this is the first of five. You know, those of you who joined us, you are a, an elite group. If you're watching this webinar and it's been recorded and you've gotten this far, wow, you've got, you really care about this issue. Uh, you are an elite group of people. You are one in a thousand, one in 10,000 people who are the kind of people who are gonna step out, step up and do something. As Kevin said, just do it. We want to help you. Uh, we've been there. Some of us have been there longer than others, but we've all been in the trenches doing this work. We want to help you. The Global Home Education Exchange is, is a project and supported by many individuals, many organizations, HSLDA USA, HSLDA Canada, Classical Conversations, many organizations uh, together are supporting it with our board members who volunteer their time. There's volunteers. Um, and uh, we want to help you because this is a global movement. We all want what's best for our children. And we just believe very passionately and strongly about this. So join us for the next sessions. The, tomorrow, we're gonna have a conversation uh, with about funding. We talked about that some today, but tomorrow we're talking all about funding. Um, Bowie, Vander Eames from South Africa, Peter Stock from Canada, Edric Mendoza from the Philippines, HSLD's Jim Mason and uh, Czech Steve Craig is gonna be presenting tomorrow. Next week, we have Building Your Team, uh, defending home education in the court of law. We're going to have Mike Ferris, uh, one of the, you know, one of the singularly unique and prestigious uh, uh, leaders in homeschooling globally from the very beginning, uh, and then advancing home education in the court of public opinion also uh, next the following week. 
So lots happening. Please uh, tell other people, other leaders you know about this and your network. And again, my thanks to the speakers today. Uh, and if you want more information about HSLDA, you can go to hslda.org or ghex.world. And I wish you all a very good day. Thank you all. The session is now ended.